Hi everybody, welcome back. Uh, this is lesson eight. So today we are going to talk about uh, Boolean values that can be returned from functions. We're going to talk about local and global variables. We're also going to talk about static variables. And then finally we're going to talk about uh, functions that use default arguments. We'll also, as usual, we'll cover the lab. So let's start off with uh, functions that return Boolean values. All right, a Boolean value is uh, the value of either true or false. And you can literally use the keyword true or false when you are returning that value from the function. Um, this is a, 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 a nice way of being able to do input validation. Um, so down here, let's look at a quick example and then we'll go over and write some code. So this is a function definition uh, for a function named is valid, and it takes an integer as an argument. We're going to declare a Boolean type variable of uh, the name status, and we're just going to check if the number is greater than 1 and it is less than 100, then we set status to true, otherwise we set it to false, and then we return that value from the function. Now this can be used to do input validation, validation like was done in your previous assignments to check that the person put a number between 1 and 3 when uh, they entered, where if they put something less than 1 or greater than 3, we held them in a loop until they gave us a, a valid argument. So before we do that or look at that, let's go ahead and just look at uh, some code that uses, or I'm sorry, a function that returns a Boolean value. So we'll go ahead and create a function. And this is our prototype, and we'll call it is even to test if a number is either even or odd. All right, so there's our function prototype. Go ahead and copy that and paste it down here. Give that variable a name. And then we'll say if num num mod 2 is equal to 0. So if num mod 2 is equal to 0, what that means is that if we divide the number by 2, and there's no remainder, that means it must be an even number, in which case we would simply return value true. Otherwise, we would return false. Okay. And up here, we'll just do a simple test. We'll go ahead and make a number read in a number, and then we will say if is even, the number that we read in, we'll see out that it is even. We're happy about that. Alright, otherwise, false. Is not even. We'll just print out not even. All right, so there we go. Very simple program. We read in a number, uh, we call our function, our function tests to see if it's even or odd, and then based on that result, we print out that it's even or odd. So let's go ahead and try it. Okay, so it's waiting for to put in a number. Let's put in an even number like 10, and it says that it is even. Let's try it again. This time we'll put in the number 3, and that is not even. So there you go. That's how you can write a function that returns a Boolean value. Um, now for the lab, instead of writing, writing a function called is even, I'm going to go ahead and just skip over to the lab. Um, it's asking you to create a function called is valid, which is going to check to see if they put a valid number for the menu choice. So all you're going to do is take your while loop that checks to see if it is um, less than 1 or greater than 3, and you're just going to put that code into the is valid function. So it would look something like, like, this. Let's go ahead and get rid of all of that. So this is now going to be 
is valid. And it is passed an integer that represents the menu choice from the user. Valid. And then down here is going to be your while loop. Where you, where you check to see if the number is less than zero, less than one, or greater than three. Now I'm not going to write all that code because I demonstrated that in a previous uh, uh, previous example. All right, so uh, here um, you would just print out the menu and then read in the person's input. So let's call it something more meaningful, like menu choice or something like that. And then down here, you would just have a loop that says while not is valid. And you're going to pass them the menu choice. Actually, I'm sorry. Yeah, that the uh, the function out here wouldn't need the while loop because it's just going to look. To, it's just going to say if. I'm mean, sorry. I shouldn't have said while loop. It's going to be an if statement. You're going to say if the um, number is less than one or num. So I'm just giving you the code now. If the num is uh, greater than three, and then you're going to, if that's true, then we know that it's not valid. So we would return false. Or actually, we would return true. Because we're saying, is it valid? No, I'm confusing myself. If, <laughs> if it is valid, so if the number is less than one or greater than three, it is not valid. So we would return false. It is not valid. Otherwise, we would return true. So there you go. That's how that would work there. And then the error checking, you would just say while the menu choice is not valid, um, we need to get an, uh, tell them that it's not invalid. So you're going to print out something that says, you know, like, it's not valid. And then you're going to have to ask for a new number. And then just read in that new value. And there you go. So then that's going to go uh, back up. It's going to call it is valid with the menu choice again. And that's just simply going to replace the code that you had previously where you had the while loop that was doing it uh, in, in the other way. So that's the one part of the lab. Um, let's go back to the reading. Okay, so let's skip down past the example that the book gives. You guys should read in here, though, just to get some practice looking at the code. The next thing we're going to talk about is local and global variables. So a local variable is a variable that is defined uh, inside of a function, and it is not accessible outside of the function. A global variable is defined outside of all functions and is accessible to all functions. So they're like opposites of each other. All right, so let's take a look at some code. So we have a local variable here. Remember, it said the variable inside of a function, but remember, there's nothing special about main. Main is just a function. So because this is declared inside main, it's considered a local variable. And then here we have another function cleverly named another function that has a variable called num as well. So we have the same variable declared here and the same name for this variable declared here. However, because local variables are only, are only visible inside of the scope of the function, this num can't see this num here, and this num can't see this num down here. So when we run the code, uh, it's going to first print out the number 1 here, we call another function, it jumps down to here, and then this cout statement is going to print out this num, 20. When we come back and print out num yet again, it's going to see this num. And as the example shows, it's going to print 1, then 20 from the function call, then 1 when it's back inside of main. All right, so that's how local functions, or I'm sorry, local variables work. Um, important to note is that the lifetime of the variable is only when the function is executing. Um, after the function uh, ends, the uh, variables that are declared inside of it are all destroyed. 
So that means that the values that are stored in there cannot be used, or you can't expect that they're still going to be there if you come back and call the function a second time. All right, um, let's move on to global variables. So a global variable is a global variable that is declared outside of all functions in the program. So in other words, up here by where the prototypes would be, you can declare variables like this, and that would be considered a global variable. It's outside of all functions. And as I said earlier, it's visible to everything. It's visible from all functions. So now if we run the same code using a global variable, note that there's no variable called num declared here, and there's no variable that called num declared here. So when we do that first line of code, num, it's going to first look here for a local variable, doesn't find one, and then finally, aha, it sees the global variable here, so this is going to print out two. Another function is called, same thing. When we go to here, it looks for a local variable, can't find it, goes outside, looks up, and there's the global variable, so it's going to print out two. And then finally, when we do this last one, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to print out. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped right here. Uh, but here, this is the catch. Um, after we print out that 2, we are reassigning num a value of 50. Now, same thing. Um, because there's nothing declared here, it's going to reassign this global variable, the value of 50. So now it's saying I change to 50. And then when we come back to here, it's going to print out 50 as well, just like it shows in the example here. All right, so that's how global variables work. It's important to note that if you do not initialize the global variable, it is initialized to a value of zero. So you can do that. You can declare a global variable, not give it an initial value, and it will automatically set it to zero. All right. Global variables are generally considered bad. Um, a common mistake when people first start to write functions, as it says here, is that they are tempted to use global variables so that they can remember what the value of that variable was between function calls. And you shouldn't do that. Instead, as we'll see in a moment, you should make it a static variable. So why are global variables generally considered bad? Global variables make debugging difficult. Um, any place in your program, so let's say that your, your program compiles and it runs, but it produces a logic error. It doesn't do what it's supposed to do. In order to figure, and, and you know that it's related to the use of a global variable. You would literally need to go through every single place, every single function, every single piece of code in your entire program that accesses the global variable to track down which, the cul which one is the culprit, who, which part of your program is causing your code not to work. Um, the other reason that they're bad is that if you write a function that depends on a global variable and you want to use that function somewhere else in a different program, then you're going to have to make it so that the program works without using that global variable. So, again, why not, why not just not make that function use a global variable in the first place? And then the last thing is that global variables make programs hard to understand. Um, if any function accesses a global variable, you also have to be aware of how all the other functions in the code access that global variable as well. So instead of understanding just one part of the, 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 the program, you need to understand all parts of the program which access the global variable, and that's not good. Now, by contrast, global constants are generally considered to be a good thing. Um, global constants are very handy, and I'm going to skip down here and just show you why. So let's say we have a program, and this is going to calculate how much to pay somebody based on how many hours they worked and if they worked overtime. So down here, um, without even getting into all the code that calculates how much to pay the person, let's just jump down to the functions that use those global constants. So notice that we have base hours used here. We have base hours being used here. We have base hours being used here. We have base hours being used here. So the nice thing is that if the base number of hours per week that a person can work before it's considered overtime changes, you don't have to go hunt down every place where you have base hours and change it. You can just change it in one place here and know that automatically everything everywhere in your program that you use base hours it will automatically become updated. So that's the, the main reason why global constants are generally considered good. Um, the other thing is it goes back to the idea of magic numbers. If we just wrote down 40, 
in all those places. Again, you'd have to hunt down everywhere in your code where you wrote the word, wrote the uh, number 40, and then update it to whatever the new ver uh, new value is for that variable, or that constant, I should say. All right. So in short, global variables were generally considered bad. Global constants generally considered very useful. Now, I did mention in class there's a concept of something called a singleton, which is a global class. Now, those are actually considered very useful, if not necessary, when writing large-scale applications and complex applications, but um, I'll save that conversation for when I talk about classes. All right, so that's global constants versus global variables. Local and global variables can have the same name. So, for example, down here, we're going to go ahead and create a global constant called birds and set that to 500. And then we're going to have another global constant down here called bird that's equal to 10,000. Now, when you do this, when you declare a variable inside of a function um, and it has the same name as a global variable, it does what's called shadowing. In other words, it hides that other global variable and prefers to use the locally declared one instead. So here in main, when we say that there are birds, in, or in main, there are birds, bird, and then over here when we call California, it's going to, it's just, I'm sorry, I just got distracted. I realized it said main, and the first time I read this, I read it as the state main because it says California here, but they meant main, main. Anyways, sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, so in, in main there are, in this case it's going to say 500 because it's using, there's no local variable called birds, it's using the global. But then down here because we do have one declared, it's going to use this number instead when it prints it here like we see in the example. In main there are 500 birds, in California there are 10,000 birds. Alright, moving on, static local variables. So I think I already mentioned that, um, that when a function ends, the variables do not persist between calls. So any locally declared variable, any variable that is um, in the parameter list, all those values go away when the function terminates. So this is quickly shown here in this example where uh, there's a local variable called uh, local num is equal to 5, and then before we exit, we set it to 99 really quick. And then up here, we can see that even though we call it twice, down here, it's going to print out five both times because each time we come in and start executing this code, a new instance of this is created in memory and initialized to five every single time we call this function. All right, so if it was the case that we wanted this to maintain its value, we would have to put the keyword static in front of it like this. So now the um, stat num is now static and it stays there every single time we call the fun the value stays there every single every single time we call the function. So if we put this in a for loop like this, we can see what the output would be. Um, it's going to be zero, one, two, three, four. So um, a couple things here to note is that this was never initialized with a value, and that's the next thing you should know for a quiz or an exam is that static variables, if you don't give them an initial value, are automatically initialized to zero kind of like with static global variables, or global variables in general. I'm sorry, no, there's no such thing as a static global. Uh, global variables uh, are also initialized with the value of zero. So they automatically are initialized to zero if you don't put something. So uh, unlike the previous example where the program ended after we snuck in the value of 99 and that got reset, now we can see that that's not happening. Now it's taking this value uh, and saving it between function calls. All right, so that's a static variable. Now, if you do initialize it to something other than zero, like here with five, um, we can see the output would change. It would be five, six, seven, eight, nine. The main idea is that it is not. If you do, if you initialize it, it is not going to initialize this to five every single time you call it. If you say that it is static, it will just start it at five the first time the function is called and then remember that value moving forward. Alright, that's static variables. So let's go ahead and jump over to the code over here again. Alright, so um, this is where we're going to make another change to our previous assignment. So we wrote a function called ask 
question in the last uh, lab where you passed it the menu choice that the user provided, either addition or a subtraction problem, and then we uh, then called the random numbers uh, function to get a high and a low number, and then we asked them the question using addition or subtraction based on whether they put one or two. Now this function is going to add, I'm sorry, this program is going to add one other feature. Whenever this, the, uh, the user enters the correct value for the problem, like 8 plus 8 is 16, we're going to not only print out that they're correct, we're also going to print out what their current accuracy is using the, that run of the program. So in other words, in the ask function, ask question function, we're going to need to save how many times the person answers the question, right? But we're also going to need to save how many total number of times the program has asked a question. That's because in order to calculate the out, uh, accuracy, you have to divide the total number of questions that they got right by the total number of questions that were asked. So you're going to have to add two static variables to the ask question function, one that simply stores the number they got right, one that stores the total number of times that it's been called. So in both of those cases, you can just initialize those static variables to zero and let the uh, program uh, advance, uh, increase those numbers uh, where, where it's needed. So every time you get it right, increase some variable called something like uh, numRight. Um, and then every time the function is called period, increase some other variable called something like um, total number, total questions, or total question, number of questions, or something like that. All right, um, and that is it. So it's a fairly simple lab compared to what we've do, been doing recently. All right, and of course, if you have not finished writing the last lab, you're going to have to finish that before you can do this one. All right, last topic uh, of the reading assignment is default arguments, and note that you do not need to use default arguments in the lab. You only need to use uh, boolean, a boolean function and uh, static variables. All right, default arguments. Default arguments are when you provide a value to use in the function if the user does not provide a value in the function call. So in other words, somebody could call show area and not pass it anything and then it would automatically default to using the values of 20 and 10 for the values defined here, length and width. All right. So let's go ahead and just take a look at an example of that behavior. So let's go ahead and just get rid of all of this. Okay. And let's go ahead and just create a very simple function that just illustrates this behavior. So here we'll just have an integer. And then we know that in the prototype, we don't have to give it a name. And if you want to provide a default argument, you just put whatever that value is. So let's just make it one arbitrarily. Um, this function doesn't do anything other than de demonstrate how default values work. So down here, let's go ahead and write our definition for it. And num. And then note that you don't need to put is equal to one. You do that in the prototype most of the time. Right, but I'll come back to that later. All right. So down here, all we're just going to do, all we're going to do, is print out the value of num, and that is it. All right. So let's go ahead and call the function. This time I will call it, but I will not pass it any arguments, even though in the parameter list I have an integer. Let's see what it does. And this, uh, what did I do? Why does this happen every time I go to demo? Hold on one second. Okay, I forgot to put the semicolon right here. I think I'm going to start because of these stupid bugs that are, again, if I was using a different compiler, it would flag that before I tried to run it. So moving forward, I might start using a different compiler because I do have Visual Studio installed on this computer, so I may start using that instead. Anyways, all right, so let's go ahead and try this again. So we're going to call this, but we are not going to pass it an argument here in which case it should use the default argument of 1. So if I run it, it says 1. If I run it again, but this time I pro provide an argument, it should print that instead. 
34. All right, so that's how default arguments work. There are, however, some limitations to what you can do with default arguments. <clears throat> Um, now, this is an important thing to note here. Um, so you saw me a moment ago put the default value in the prototype. And, however, it does say here that default arguments can be specified in the function header, and that would be in the definition of the full function, like this. But um, this is the problem. A function's default arguments should be assigned at the earliest occurrence of the function name which is usually, as it says here, the function prototype. We usually put the function prototypes above main and the definitions after. And remember in the last uh, lecture I mentioned that you don't want to put the function definitions before main because you run into the dependency issue of like declaring all the functions in the right order if you're going to have functions calling other functions. Whereas if you use prototypes, you don't need to worry about that. So, um, even though you can do this, you probably won't do this because you're going to use prototypes like you're supposed to. At least you should. All right. Uh, a moment ago I said that there are limits to what you can do with a uh, function, uh, I'm sorry, with default variables. Um, def I'm sorry, default arguments. Okay. So, and that limitation is right here. So in the example that I showed you, um, there was only one variable. But if you have more than one variable and you want to use default arguments, you can't leave out something uh, to the left. Uh, I'm sorry, how do I say this? All the default arguments have to be placed to the right of non-default arguments. So in other words, we can't make this a default argument and then make this a non-default argument. Right? So let me go ahead and just show you, if that sounds a little confusing, it's okay. Um, let me go ahead and show you down here. It's much easier to see here. So here we're using a default argument for this variable, but we do not have a default argument here. So a function call for this could potentially look like calc pay with a number and then leave a blank and then another number provided by the user. And as we saw up here, we can't do that. We can't have a default argument that is to the left of a non-default argument. All default arguments have to be placed to the right in your parameter list. So down here, we have a default argument that is not to the right of a non-default argument. And then this one is also illegal because we have a default argument that is not to the right of these non-default arguments. All right, so that's the limitation with default arguments um, and, of course, that only comes into play if you're mixing default arguments with non-default arguments. Um, actually, that's not true because uh, you could make these all default arguments and you couldn't, again, you couldn't leave it blank, blank, and then provide a number. Um, the only thing that be left is uh, left blank is things that are to the right of the default argument. So, in other words, if this was default, a default argument, these are also both default arguments. I could call calc, play, calc pay and then provide a number here and then leave these two out and then it would go ahead and use the default values. All right. Okay. Um, but again, the, the easy way to remember it is that default arguments always have to be placed to the right of non-default arguments when you use them. All right. And that will do it for lesson number eight. I hope you guys are finding these videos useful and that they're not too confusing. Um, and uh, I will be thinking of you guys, hoping you're staying safe and healthy.